On April the 6th, 1917, the United States of America declared war on Germany. For two and a half years, the most powerful nation in the world had stood apart from Europe's mortal struggle. Now, at last, she was drawn in. Many months would pass before her soldiers could be ready for battle. But to the war-weary allies, she brought a new vision of victory. America had traveled a long road since August 1914. The outbreak of war in Europe at first barely touched the American people. Its coming took a form hardly physical at all. It came as newspaper dispatches from far away. Far away in the distance and even farther away in spirit. The dispatches were as if black flocks of birds, frightened from their familiar rookeries, came darting across the ocean. Their excited cries a tiding of stirring events. In 1914, Europe's quarrels seemed to be no concern of Americans. They were a nation born out of the need to become and remain separate from Europe. George Washington had expressed their creed. Why quit our own to stand upon foreign ground? Why, by interweaving our destiny with that of any part of Europe, entangle our peace and prosperity in the toils of European ambition, rivalship, interest, humor, or caprice. Separatism, which inspired the first Americans, also helped to drive forward the new nation's expansion. In the 19th century, millions of personal decisions by Europeans to break away from the fetters of the old world brought a swift increase of population to America. Every immigrant fought his private war of independence when he took the decision to uproot himself from the land of his birth and cross the Atlantic. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these the homeless tempest-tossed to me. These Americans wanted no part of Europe. It was a new world that they were seeking. They found the fruits of isolationism sweet. They acquired greater wealth and material power than the world had ever known. In America, men could make vast personal fortunes with astounding speed. Andrew Carnegie, when he retired, gave away $350 million. America was the land of promise. Poor men could grow rich almost overnight. they could also remain very poor. In the Dust Bowl, in the spreading factories of Detroit or Baton Rouge or Chicago, in the swelling cities with their slums which matched the slums of Europe, there was squalor, misery, bitterness. For many immigrants and their sons, it was a poor exchange to escape servitude to Europe's hereditary princes, only to find servitude to Wall Street's tycoons.
Tycoons were tough. The first battles of American trade unions were battles indeed. 32 men were killed in a coal field strike in Colorado. A bomb in the printing works of a Los Angeles newspaper killed 19 people. Then we went to hear Emma Goldman at the Bronx Casino, but the meeting was forbidden and the streets around were very crowded. And there were moving vans moving through the crowd and they said the moving vans were full of cops with machine guns. Everybody was talking machine guns, revolution, civil liberty, freedom of speech. But occasionally somebody got in the way of a cop and was beaten up and shoved into a patrol wagon. And everybody said it was an outrage. And what about Washington and Jefferson and Patrick Henry? And yet America offered abundant space to her people with a sense of promise never far away. At the turn of the century, the frontier, the legendary, luring frontier of the West, had vanished. From the Atlantic to the Pacific, the nation was one. And at about this time, Americans who had confined their expansion within their coasts began to look beyond them. While Britain was fighting her war in South Africa, America fought Spain and became a surprised imperialist. She freed Cuba, but she acquired the rich Philippine Islands and Hawaii. The spokesman of this extrovert American mood was Theodore Roosevelt, twice Republican president. Our nation, while first of all seeing to its own domestic well-being, must not shrink from playing its part among the great nations without. Speak softly and carry a big stick. Roosevelt's bounding personal vitality matched that of a nation whose pioneer days were barely finished, which recognized no challenge which the human muscle and spirit could not overcome. After his presidency, Roosevelt departed for a long tour of Africa and South America. He had made America's voice heard in the world's affairs. He had intervened in the war between Russia and Japan. He had spoken up when France and Germany quarreled over Morocco. He had seized Latin American territory to build the Panama Canal. But his ideas carried the American people beyond their present understanding of themselves. In 1914, after 20 years out of office, the Democrats swept back to power on the rallying cry of reform. The new president, Woodrow Wilson, voiced the nation's chief concerns. We have been proud of our industrial achievements, but we have not hitherto stopped thoughtfully to count the human cost. Our duty is to cleanse, to reconsider, to restore every process of our common life. When war broke out in Europe, America could scarcely have had a president more likely to keep her out of it. Woodrow Wilson was an austere, withdrawn intellectual, the son of a Presbyterian clergyman. He had spent most of his life in the seclusion of the academic world. His orderly mind found difficulty in grasping the complex dilemmas of the world outside the campus. But all his instincts were for peace. Sometimes people call me an idealist. Well, that is the way I know I am an American. America is the only idealist nation in the world. The idealism of the American people was often confused and colored with the boastfulness of a young and thriving country. Any intelligent American mechanic could see that if the Europeans hadn't been a lot of ignorant, underpaid foreigners who drank, smoked, were loose about women and wasteful in their methods of production, the war could never have happened. Most Americans were well satisfied when Wilson stated the nation's posture towards Europe's war. We must be impartial in thought as well as in action. Must put a curb upon our sentiments as well as upon every transaction that might be construed as a preference of one party 